Today will be about uh, the story of uh, what is known as the story um, of the elephant, the monkey, and the partridge. But uh, the story is differently is known uh, in different under different names. So um, in the area where it's most known in Bhutan and Tibet, Tibet. It's uh, actually called the Four Harmonious Animals. And you might notice that uh, there are differences in the story, but uh, actually the story is the similar and very similar in the different uh, traditions of Buddhism. And it's a story about harmony. It's a story about cooperation. And it's also a story about respecting each other. So let's uh, dive into it. Um, this is the three animals that we're talking about today. And some of you might have noticed that uh, I just mentioned four harmonious animals. So there are some versions which have four and some rich versions which have three animals. And you can see the partridge. Do you have partridges in, uh, in, in, in America? I'm sure you have them somewhere. It's such a large continent. Mm. So um, the partridges are uh, a symbol of wisdom in Indian culture, traditionally. So that's something to take with you when you listen to the story. Uh, let me just go through this now. So the story as it is known in the, in the Theravada tradition, in the Pali tradition, in Thai tradition, we call it the Titira Chataka. That's a very long name for, for difficult to pronounce maybe. The Titira Chataka is uh, one of the Jatakas, as you may have uh, remembered from the first time we, we started with this series of talks or maybe you want to call them short, uh, short uh, talks. Um, the first talk I mentioned that many of the Buddhist stories are uh, part of the collection of Jatakas and the Jatakas are the birth stories or the stories of the previous lives of the Buddha. So the Buddha talks about his previous existences and these are in the forms of fables or in the forms of legends and then he mentions what he learned from those previous existences, which is quite interesting because sometimes he also makes mistakes. And uh, considering that how important we consider and how perfect we, consider, we hold the Buddha to be in Buddhism, it's quite important to see that even the most perfect human being in the Buddhist perspective is still talking about the mistakes he made before he became reach this per stage of perfection. So that's something that we can take with us as a lesson. There is no one who has not fallen once to stand up again and to carry on. So uh, that's before we, uh, that's just a general thought before we start. This story is traditionally a very important children's story in Buddhist countries because it deals with respect. And in some countries, as I mentioned, like Bhutan, the story has become a national symbol. Uh, so in Bhutan um, and in Tibet, it's known as the four harmonious animals. And I'm not going to try to pronounce the Tibetan <laughs> because I will probably utterly fail. And it's actually a Western version of the story. And uh, it, you may have heard of it. It's a story in the um, collection of the Butters of Butters Grimm. Sorry, I missed the T there, but that should read brothers. And they have a classic collection of fairy tales and uh, some of those stories have also been made into movies by Disney. And uh, one story is known as the Town Musicians of Bremen. And uh, um, this uh, story also relates the aspect of cooperation, but let's not, uh, uh, let's not make the introduction too long. 
Here is a picture of how um, this is a sort of painting that you will find everywhere in the area of Bhutan and Tibet. Even in the West, even in the Holland, there is a Tibetan temple in, uh, in um, uh, quite not so far from here. And they have one painting like this. So in this painting, you can see four animals sitting on top of each other, trying to reach a tree. What have they been doing that they have started to, to work like this? Uh, here you can see another one. This is actually uh, a, a, re a relief. This is actually not a painting, but a relief. Here you can find them again. I think this artist was not aware how monkeys look like. <laughs> so it may have been a painting from a long time ago. And this is the German version of the story. Uh, you can see that the elephant has disappeared from the Germanic version of the story because they didn't have any elephants <laughs> in the West in those days. So the story starts by um, um, an event that happened in the time of the Buddha. And this is like the introduction to what, why the Buddha had to relate the story, why the Buddha had to talk about the story. So the story happens when uh, a number of monks heard that the Buddha was, um, as they were traveling with the Buddha, usually the Buddha would travel with a, with a large number of uh, monks as he is following. And uh, the, the news went, the news uh, was spread that the Buddha was going to the quite uh, well, um, well, I wouldn't say luxurious, but it was quite a, quite a large temple known as Jetavana. Uh, Jetavana is, uh, you can still find the ruins in India. And Jetavana is like, a, was like a very comfortable, very well provided for temple. And um, um, this place, uh, of course, this made some of the monks very enthusiastic, very interest, interested. They wanted to go there for a while. And they thought maybe if we use some trick we can be the first to get there to get the best rooms. And they talked like this amongst each other. And so they decided that they would travel very quickly. So they made sure that they had some shortcuts along the route. And then they were able to reach the Chetavana temple before the other people reached, before the other monks. So, of course, this uh, led them to take the best rooms in the temple and where, whereas the other monks had to take the rooms that were not so good. Uh, at night, uh, the Buddha arrived uh, a little at night and then he, as he was uh, uh, during the night, uh, the Buddha did not sleep that long. So as he was waking in an, at night, uh, he heard a sound coming from outside. And then he suddenly realized that one of his foremost disciples known as the Venerable Sariputta was, a, was actually sleeping outside. Now the Venerable Sariputta was the most, one of the most respected disciples of the Buddha. So the Buddha was a bit uh, shocked to see that his foremost disciple who was a model of wisdom and a well, very well-practiced monk was actually sleeping outside. So it turned out that all the good rooms were taken and that the well-respected monk known as the Venerable Sariputta, though he did not complain, it should be noted, that he did not have a good room at all. So the turns out that the monks who did not be, behave very well, they were known as the group of six, it turns out that this group of six had taken all the good rooms and eventually uh, this kind of became the pattern and even uh, the Venerable Sariputta then had to sleep outside because there were no rooms left. So the Buddha was a bit concerned that there was no uh, respect shown towards one another. In fact, uh, some of the monks that had taken the best rooms 
were actually only ordained for a few years. They were not particularly experienced monks or something like that. And they did not respect the teachers and the leaders of the monastic community at all. So this was not a very good thing. And the Buddha, therefore, he asked all the monks to come together in a meeting. And uh, you might expect him to punish all the monks or something like that, that were doing wrong, all the monks that were doing wrong. But in fact, the Buddha, he always taught with wisdom. So he would very carefully explain by allowing the monks to realize their own mistake. So he, he told them that, uh, he asked them, how should we normally uh, respect each other in the monkhood? Should we, what should we consider our criterion? Why and how should we respect the people the, the, the monk in the monkhood? And some of the monks, they, in the group of six, they responded that uh, we should respect each other according to caste, which means the, the, this, you know, the, the kind of um, um, uh, class uh, in, in, in uh, Indian society. And another monk said, no, we shouldn't respect each other according to class. We should respect each other according to knowledge. Any monk who has learned a lot, we should respect and hold the highest in the monastic community. And then another monk said, no, to being learned is not important at all. We should respect the monks who have meditated the most and who are most advanced in their meditation. Those we should respect the most. And so they were discussing and debating and no, we, no one really knew the answer of how we should respect each other. And the Buddha then told a story. And this story is the story that we're going to study today. And this story is about a, a monkey, as you already guessed, the monkey and the uh, elephant and the partridge. And in the story, there were only three animals. There was no hair in the Thai version of the story. And uh, these animals, they lived together in a forest, but they didn't live together very harmoniously. Sometimes the elephant would uh, sometimes um, shake the tree in which the bird was sitting, causing the bird almost to fall out. Sometimes the bird would uh, poop on the elephant's head or on the monkey's head. And the monkey would sometimes tease the bird or tease the monkey, uh, tease the elephant. So they would fight amongst each other like this all the time. And until a certain point, they were not at peace at all. They were not happy at all. They were fighting so much that they kind of felt their, their life was not, they didn't have a happy life anymore. So they tried to figure out how they could somehow live together more harmoniously. Then they discussed amongst each other who of our, who amongst us has lived in this forest the longest? Who has lived in this forest for the longest time? And then the, the elephant said, well, when I was living in this forest, you see that tree over there? When I was still, when I came to live here in this forest, the tree was so small, it was like, it was like on my belly and I could really rub myself with it if I had some, uh, had some ache or something like that in my belly. And you can see the elephant's belly here. But then the monkey said, you know, I was here before you because when I was uh, still um, uh, a little monkey, I was actually eating from this tree. And this tree wasn't even a tree yet. It was like more like a plant. And I was eating from the leaves, as you can see in this picture. But then the bird said, well, did you know that how this tree came to grow? 
in this area. I was the one who pooped, <laughs> again, who pooped in this place. And that's why the tree grow, grew from this place. Because I pooped a little seed right there and it caused the tree to grow. And so they were talking amongst each other and they suddenly realized that the smallest animal was actually the most experienced, the most uh, lived there for the longest. He was most experienced or most the oldest animal. So this was like their, they came to the conclusion that they actually the more strongest animal which normally would be the boss like, right? According to the pecking order, which we normally think of when we think of animals, the biggest animal must always be the boss, right? But in this case, it turned out that the bird was actually the oldest animal and the uh, elephant was the youngest. And they decided to respect each other, not according to strength, not according to the pecking order, and not according to how uh, animals would normally respect each other, but respect each other according to age, according to experience. And then the Buddha said that after the animals decided to respect each other according to age, then they were able to live in harmony together because they were different animals with different strengths, but they were working together and they could reach the highest branches and reach the highest fruits in this way. They could work together and they could get all the best fruit, working together, living together in harmony. So this is the image which you can see in so many places in the South Asia. You can even see uh, some Tibetan ancient banknotes before Tibet was uh, invaded by China. And uh, you can see in the banknotes that they have these four harmonious animals as well. So this shows that uh, in, in ancient Tibet, in ancient Tibet, these four harmonious animals were given the same importance as we would normally give uh, in the West to a president or to an important scientist or artist, <laughs> which is kind of an interesting thing. So uh, in this story, it shows that, uh, oh, one more thing. In the German story, actually, um, there is a, a burglar coming to the house and then four animals, they decide to climb on top of each other so they can no longer, uh, they can work together like this and chase the burglar away because the burglar is so confused seeing four animals sitting on top of each other that he very, very frightfully, very frightened, he suddenly runs away. So this is a story about uh, four animals cooperating with each other. Although in the Western story, the, the story doesn't mention the aspect of age. But uh, the story talks about cooperation, it talks about working together. This is sometimes known in, uh, in, uh, in the West as respect, respecting each other, taking care of each other. Might be interesting to know if the word respect has the same meaning in Buddhism as it has in the West? And the answer is partly. In the West, we normally these days use the word respect in terms of respecting each other's rights, respecting each other's uh, uh, freedoms and giving each other space. However, if you look at the word respect, it actually originally, it comes from the word, the Latin, Respicere. Respicere, my, my Latin languages are not that good if anyone wants to correct me. Respicere means looking back. Looking back, in other words, to carefully look at something. Therefore, in Buddhism, the meaning is very similar to the Latin. It means a deep realization of the good qualities. The word respect in, in Buddhism, in, in Pali Buddhism, is actually very similar to the word guru, which we use for a teacher. Um, so the word karu, or respect, uh, coming from the 
is 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 uh, then made into the word karava, which uh, is respect or reference. So this means uh, kalu actually means heavy, or you could also say a deep and intense realization of the good qualities. So when we look at somebody, we deeply realize they have good qualities in them that we should look at. That is what we call respect. Or we respect certain objects which are related to people, for example, uh, or related to good qualities. For example, the national flag in many countries is respected as a very important symbol. But for a Buddhist, a Buddha image is also a very important symbol of respect. And respect works like a filter to learn about another person's good qualities very deeply. The way we learn respect according to, um, according to, to Buddhism, uh, in Thai Buddhism specifically, there is a word in Thai Buddhism which is yom rap napti. Yom rap napti is a word in Thai language which is, uh, if you break it down, it means, it means refers to four steps for important aspects of respect. Yom is very similar to the Western sense of respect. That means having nothing against the other person, respecting another person's freedoms, another person's rights, not infringing upon another person's rights. Yom is specifically also means that you're not allowing jealousy or anger to blind you from the good qualities another person has. Rab means making the decision to want to learn from another person. So this is more than just the Western sense of universal respect, but it also is a sense of acknowledgement that somebody has very good characteristics. So when the Buddha talked this, taught this story about the three or the four harmonious animals, then he would very clearly also would like to point out that some monks have been very experienced, have been ordained for many years and should be respected and acknowledged for that. And so it's not only about a universal sense of respect, but it's also about an acknowledgement for people's good qualities, that people who have been uh, in this, on the spiritual path for a long time but it can be also be a sense of acknowledgement of somebody who we are indebted to, for example, our parents or um, friends or relatives of ours, of ours, who we know are very good people with good character, then we might want to learn from these people. And that is what we call Rab. Nap goes a little further, actually saying that wanting to learn from other people is like a process. Nap literally means to count and uh, you could say that it is a form of counting because when you are really respecting another person, you really want to know which kind of qualities do they have that I can learn from. Te means to actually uh, bring these qualities into practice in our daily life. So uh, it's sometimes said of the Buddhist teaching that everything in the Buddhist teaching can be taken upon your own character, can be integrated into your own character. This is sometimes called opanayiko, which means uh, to actually bring it inside, put it, bring it, work it into your daily life. So these are some components of respect. You can see that in Buddhism, uh, whether you talk about the universal sense of respect or the acknowledgement which we have to somebody who is virtuous, who is of good character, that it goes a lot deeper than the normal idea that we have of respect. Some people think respect means that I allow you to think everything you want to think. And as long as you can say everything you want, you can have your own opinion, but I am wearing headphones. <laughs> I'm not listening to you at all. <laughs> so this is the sense of respect, which is kind of different than uh, the sense of respect, which is active, what we are talking about here. So this is an important part because right now in, uh, in the English speaking world, this is quite an important uh, uh, debate, you know. Uh, for example, if you look at all the protests of, uh, with regard to the killing of George Floyd, this is very much a, a discussion also about what it means to respect somebody. And um, so 
there are some ways that you could say that respect is like a sort of a, a sense of uh, wanting to learn. Uh, and in that way, it's the first step in the spiritual life. When you are becoming a monk, a Buddhist monk, you have to also state your intention. That is what you want as you, you becoming a monk. You want to state your intention to learn from your teachers. So that's very important. And many important teachings about the good and beautiful life cannot be found in books, but we can learn them from other people. So if you have ever uh, heard about the teachings of Lumpi Nicolas, uh, Lumpi Nicolas was also my teacher and he's teaching in uh, Azusa in uh, California most of the time. And um, uh, he actually uh, said that uh, we most of the time uh, he would uh, sometimes he said that uh, virtue doesn't come unpackaged. That is one thing that he said once. <laughs> it's kind of funny. But what he meant by that is that many good qualities in life, we can only learn by observing another person. When he said that virtue doesn't come unpackaged means that it always, we can learn about the theory of compassion and know everything about compassion. We might read a thousand books of our favorite teachers, for example, the Dalai Lama or anyone else. But if we have never really looked at another person with respect, wanting to learn from that person, then compassion can never be a concrete part of our lives. So this is a very, uh, very uh, profound statement that I think uh, he very well observed. Uh, and this is something we can see uh, in general. And um, so respect is therefore not only something which we have for some in the sense of the law, or like you say, when somebody has good faith or respects another person's rights or uh, freedom. It's also not only referring to respecting the clergy, it's also referring no, not only referring to respecting monks or something like that, but it's respecting another person for their good qualities and wanting to find their strengths. So even the Buddha, when he had just become enlightened, he actually said that he respected the Dhamma to which he was awakened. In other words, the very truth or the very good teachings to which he was awakened, that he was, had become enlightened about, that is the thing that he uh, respected as his guideline in life. So respect is something we can practice often. And the more we, we give it in the sense of our words, in the sense of the way we express it, the more we gain it. Like in the example of the founder of our temple, uh, Kunyai Atan, who was an important nun uh, in our tradition, she actually said that she actually very often was very humble and this caused her to be uh, like a very respectful person. So respect is never lost when you give it to somebody who you acknowledge as very virtuous or very good character. So these are some uh, examples of how respect can be expressed. This is important in, in, in uh, Buddhist culture. Sakara means to show, a, to use an object, for example, a candle or another kind of way to express respect. It can be to the Buddha, it can be to a teacher. For example, many Thai people express respect to their teacher, whether religious or secular, uh, whether in religious terms or worldly terms, they may respect their teacher by jasmine flowers. This we don't have much in the West, but we do have a sense of paying respect physically. For example, uh, we have some um, uh, ways to express respect physically in the West as well. For example, the genuflection, uh, which is now a bit of a debate among sport players. Genuflection is very pretty common for Catholic people when you are uh, respecting the, the, the altar or the, um, um, I don't know exactly the right word in English, but uh, respecting Jesus. 
or something like that is also uh, shown uh, by physically respecting uh, by going through your knee, going on one knee or going on two knees. And you can also respect uh, in many other ways somebody that you acknowledge. But in Asia, there are many more ways than we have in the West. We can respect by bowing or respect by using our hands, which we sometimes refer to as Anjali or in Thai language, Wai. So these are some examples of how we can express respect. So these are not uh, ancient or old fashioned customs, but they are very nice, uh, beautiful customs, which are connected with a culture of wanting to learn, because we all will know that uh, we, there's so much we cannot learn from books. There's so much we have to learn from others in life. Therefore, uh, when we look back to the elephant, the partridge and the monkey, we are therefore also learning about uh, the importance of seeing the other's good qualities. So this is the story I'd like to talk about today. Are there any questions or comments about this?